Well, what is, what's the hardest thing that you would say that you've ever uh, accomplished? Maybe it's passing an exam or graduating college or making it to retirement. Now, every one of these things you know, requires hard work, dedication, and even perseverance. You know, and one of the one of my favorite films is Remember the Titans, the, one of the good Disney films that, 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 that speaks of uh, this um, mode of, of overcoming great odds in order to be victorious, right? A, a segregated football team. Right? They become integrated with a, a new black coach. And this is a, a, a school that is a, a powerhouse football program. But as you know, when powerhouses are there, they really don't like much change. And few thought that this change was going to succeed, and in fact, it almost didn't. But winning football games was not their greatest challenge. No, they had to overcome severe racial tension. Coach Herman Boone, he, he takes this struggling team that, that he's got, and, and, and he takes them to, to Gettysburg, where the great Civil War battle was fought. And And he speaks these words to his team. He says, 50,000 men died right here on this field, fighting the same fight that we're still fighting amongst ourselves today. This green field right here was painted red, bubbling with the blood of young boys, smoke and hot lead pouring right through their bodies. Listen to their souls, men. I killed my brother with malice in my heart. Hatred destroyed my family. You listen, and you take a lesson from the dead. If we don't come together right now on this hallowed ground, we too will be destroyed, just like they were. I don't care if you like each other or not, but you will respect each other, and maybe, I don't know, maybe we'll learn to play this game like men. Well, if you've seen the film, you know that they did come together and they did what no one else expected them to do. They, they finished victorious because they played the game like men. They sacrificed for each other and they could believe that they could do what no one else thought they could. And on the cross, Jesus finished what he came to do. He finished what the Jews tried to prevent, and he accomplished what no one else could. Today's message is titled, It Is Finished. We will see that the blood of Jesus washes away our sins and frees us to live for him. The blood of Jesus washes away our sins and frees us to live for him. So read along with me this morning. John chapter 19, verses 28 through 42. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there, so they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. And when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit since it was the day of preparation. And so that the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath for that Sabbath was a high day. The Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. So the soldiers came and they broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with them. But but when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear and at once there came out blood and water. He who saw it has borne witness. His testimony is true and he knows that he is telling the truth that you also may believe. For these things took place, that the scripture might be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. And again, another scripture says, they will look on him whom they have pierced. After these things, 
Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly, for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him permission. So he came and took his body. Nicodemus also, who earlier had come to Jesus by night, came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds in weight. So they took the body of Jesus and bound it in linen cloths with the spices, as is the burial custom of the Jews. Now the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had yet been laid. So because of the Jewish day of preparation, since the tomb was close at hand, they laid Jesus there. Would you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for revealing us through your word. God, you tell us that all Scripture, God, is breathed by you. God, and that you have given it to us so that we may be equipped for every good work. Lord, through the power of the Holy Spirit, I ask that you would speak to us for you. You alone have the words of eternal life. God, if there be anyone here, God, if has not trusted in you as their Savior and Lord, God, I pray that you would show them the ugliness of their sin and the beauty and goodness of the gospel. May today be the day of their salvation. Amen. What is the blood of Jesus that washes away our sins and frees us to live for him. The blood of Jesus washes away our sins and it frees us to live for him. We're going to see that this morning in, in three different ways. We're going to see in, in one, we're going to see that it fulfills the scriptures, that it does what we cannot do, and it gives us power. The blood of Jesus fulfills the scriptures. It it does what we can do, and it gives us it gives us power. First, it fulfills the scriptures. If we were to look here to John chapter nineteen, verse twenty eight, we see that after this, right, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, he said this to fulfill the scripture. So in this passage, we've got a couple of cases where it is explicitly told us that what is taking place is to fulfill the Scripture. Others are implied as, as well. And in verse 29, we read that a jar of sour wine stood there. So they put a sponge of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. So Jesus, speaking this word, saying, I thirst... Right? It's the fulfillment of a prophecy that comes from David in Psalm 69, verse 21. It says, they gave me poison for food. Look at it, for my thirst. They gave me not just any wine, right, but sour wine to drink. Now, what this wine was typically given to, to those um, at, at the end of their life in the crucifixion process, and a lot of times it was there to, to prolong uh, the death, a cruel way to torture those with which were hanging there, just, you know, I mean, just waiting, waiting in excruciating pain to, to die. But with Jesus, the words, I thirst, come with great irony. You know, back in John chapter 7, Jesus said that on the last day of the feast, this great day, he stood up and he says, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and to drink. You know, John uses this irony here to, to make his point that Jesus is fully man, but he is also fully God. You see, Jesus, he identifies with our weaknesses. But even hanging on the cross, he was not desperate no, the reason he drank that wine, that sour wine, it was in order to fulfill the scriptures. So they, they took this sponge and they, they, they dipped it in a bucket of sour wine. Now, some historians have said that, that a sponge like this would be used to clean toilets. 
and they took that sponge, soaked with this wine, and they stuck it on the end of a hyssop branch. Now, we have any horticulturists out here? You, you might know what a hyssop branch is. I, I did not. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it, uh, you know, I am picture that it, it would be kind of a long branch of, of almost, you know, kind of thick, but not too heavy to where you could lift it up. Because, you know, we always picture Jesus hanging up on this high cross and, and you, he would take it and extend it out so that he could drink. But when I looked and saw what a hyssop branch looked like, I was like, how could this be it? <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a small little uh, kind of a leafy-like, uh, almost kind of picture it is out in, in, a, in a field, very thin. So they would have to take the, the you know, kind of the, the meat, the, the, the stalk there, and put this branch. Well, you know, sometimes what we see in movies or what we get our conceptions of what is, is not always reality. Jesus wasn't hanging on some cross super far away. In fact, the cross was just above the ground. All right? In fact, the, the, the vertical beam was no more than, than 10 foot. Right? And, and so they would, they would place the, the, the condemned on the cross, and then they would raise that cross up. So yes, he is elevated. You could see him, but it's not like everybody's looking up really uh, high. And they, it was close enough to where they could take a branch, a small hyssop branch, and hold it up to his mouth in order to drink. Now, I don't know if the hyssop branch was the typical uh, branch that they would use in order to, to give this sour wine to those that are hanging on the cross, but, but it is very special. And it was done for a specific purpose here for Jesus for the reason that it was a hyssop branch, was in order to fulfill Scripture. Way back in the book of Exodus, chapter 12, you read that it says, take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is in the basin and touch the lintel and the two doorposts with the blood that is in the base, basin. None of you shall go out of the door of his house until morning. Now, if you're familiar with the Passover, Right, Jesus has, or God has, has um, extended these plagues to Egypt. Uh, the, we got the frogs and the locusts and, the, uh, and all of the, the darkness, all of this nastiness, and then we come to the, the final plague. I didn't know the plague of death. So Jesus instructs his people to take the, the blood of a sacrificed animal and to place it on their doorposts. But he gave them very specific instructions in how they were to do so. Not just to the animal, although it had to be an unblemished animal, to the best that they had, but down to the very means with which they applied it. They used a bunch of hyssop, almost like a paintbrush, and painted the blood of the animal on the door. And then when the angel of death came and he saw that blood, he would pass over and he would save them from death. Oh, the blood of Jesus saves us from death too. But we also see that that Jesus' bones were, were broken. You know, sometimes uh, on the cross, a person would hang for for days before they would finally die. I can't imagine what that must be like. But the Romans, they liked it. <laughs> oh, they enjoyed seeing the suffering, the torment of, of people that they didn't like. In fact, it's one of the reasons that they gave them this sour wine was to prolong, to extend the suffering. But there were occasions when they would seek to expedite their death. Sometimes they just got tired of, of waiting and and in this case, it was, they were asked by the Jews to, look, we got to wrap this thing up. So what they would do, not in a benevolent way, but they would take a, a heavy hammer. With all their might, they would take it and swing it at the legs of the one hanging on that cross, breaking the bones, shattering them, so that the condemned could no longer raise themselves to take a breath 
finally suffocating to death. In fact, in 1968, there was an excavation that was done, and ancient skeletal remains were found of a person that was crucified, and it showed that the legs were broken as well. But this instant in specific was because it was getting close to the Sabbath day, and, and the Jews, they they wanted to be sure that Jesus was dead. They wanted to see it with their very two eyes, that he was no longer alive, that they were indeed victorious. But the dilemma they had is they were coming up on Sabbath, a day where they could do no work, and they must rest. And so they requested Pilate to break their legs and doing so. But even with Jesus hanging on the cross, do you know the Jews saw themselves as the ones living by the law, doing everything the way they are supposed to do, for they were keeping the Sabbath day holy, even while the Lord of the Sabbath hang on the cross. But this too, everything happened according to the Scriptures, that it might be fulfilled. In this verse 36 and 37, for these things took place that the Scripture might be fulfilled. Not one of his, Jesus' bones, will be broken. Then another Scripture says, they will look on him whom they have pierced. Right? The, John writing here to, in his gospel is referring back to the Old Testament prophet of Zechariah, where Zechariah says, And I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and pleas for mercy, so that when they look on me, on him whom they have pierced, they shall mourn for him as one mourns for an only child, and they shall weep bitterly over him as one weeps for the firstborn. I look how the author of Hebrews explains it. He says, for when every commandment of the law had been declared by Moses to all the people, he took the blood of calves and goats with water and scarlet wool and with, there's hyssop, and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people. The prophet Isaiah tells us in verse 59, or 50, in chapter 53, verse 9, he says, And they made his grave with the wicked and the with a rich man his death, although he had done no violence, and there was no deceit in his mouth. Everything that took place on that Good Friday was done in order to fulfill the Scriptures. From the type of wine that Jesus drank to the, 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 the stick of hyssop that it was given to him, the fact that his bones were not broken as the two robbers were. For when they came to Christ, he was already dead. And what did they do? They took a spear and stuck it in his side. And out comes blood and water, proving that Jesus was dead but everything done according to the Scriptures. Jesus was crucified among the wicked, two condemned robbers on both sides, and he did no violence. There was no deceit. Everything that came from his mouth was truth. With a rich man in his death, Jesus was buried in the tomb of a rich man. See, we can trust Scripture for everything. Absolutely, we trust it for our salvation. That's why many times in, in, in presenting the gospel to some, we use verses like John 3, 16, or the Romans' road to salvation. Why? Because we know that we are saved according to the Scriptures. But also, we can trust the Word of God for everything that we have in life. Right for the problems that we face on a daily basis. For when we are encountering a time where we're tempted to sin against God, or when we face persecution in the world because of what we believe, 
right? We trust in the word of God, all of it from Genesis to Revelation, right? Because as Paul tells Timothy, he says that all scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. So that, this is why, that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Just as a football team or a basketball team or a, 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 a you know what a an orchestra or a musical cast they they go to practice they practice they rehearse each and every day very hard so that they are equipped for the game for the performance friends we are in the game of life the performance of the real world, and how are we equipped by the very God-breathed scriptures? All these words have life, for it is how God has revealed himself to us. So we can trust knowing that when we read Psalm 139, that God created us in our mother's womb, that this isn't an opinion or a a, a governmental policy. No, it is the very word of God. And Yes, you may disagree with it, but to do so means that you're living contrary to God's word. This is why we have so much focus placed on the scriptures. Look here what John says in, in verse 35. It says, He, speaking of himself, who saw it, has borne witness. His testimony is true. And he knows that he is telling the truth that you also may believe. We trust the scriptures for our good. That's why John is full of it. That's why Jesus spoke often of the Old Testament. Why? To give us confidence that what they say is true. And friends, when we proclaim the word of God, when we read it, when we study, we too have that exact same confidence. And so when others say, well, you know what, this is, you know, I understand that back in those days, this is what it was, but times are are different. We can say, no. And guess what? It's not our opinion. Now, they may reject it, but they're not rejecting you. They are rejecting God, just as the people rejected Jesus Christ in the first century. Our confidence is in the Word of God. Secondly, the blood of Jesus does what we cannot do. Look here what happens in verse 30. It says, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Now, again, this is, you know, when we see kind of the, you know, the passion of Christ is a little more modern version, but back in the day on the old reels, you would watch, you know, videos of Jesus and, and crucified. We, we, we see him, you know, almost at the, just gasping, and it, it is, but you get the sense of Jesus is finally glad that it's done. This, hey, you know what? You've had your peace. They look, it's done. And we, we wait and we, we, we see the victory comes on the resurrection. But in the original language in the Greek that is given here for it is finished, it's just one word. And that word is not a sign of defeat. It's not a sign of desperation. It's not a, I'm just so glad that it's over. No, it is, oh, it is an announcement of triumph. For when Jesus said, it is finished, Jesus accomplished what he came to do, what the Father had sent him to do, to Be sin for us, to take on our sin, to die so that we might live. Jesus willingly gave up his life to pay the penalty for our sins. Look here what John says in chapter 10. It says that no one takes it, speaking of Jesus, from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. Nothing in 
My hands I bring only to the cross that I clean. Jesus didn't just die to give us eternal life. No, he died to give us an abundant life here on earth. But we must, we must live every day with the cross in view. We must, we must one, be grateful for Jesus. Realizing that there is nothing that we bring to the table, but we also must remember that we are to die to our sin, and to live in the power of the Holy Spirit. That brings us lastly to the blood of Jesus gives us power. It gives us power. Look here in verse 38 and 39. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him permission. So he came and took away his body. But Nicodemus also, who earlier had come to Jesus by night, came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds in weight. These two unlikely disciples of Jesus are mentioned here. We don't know much about them. Nicodemus, we know back to John chapter 3, our famous John 3.16 passage, where Nicodemus at, at, at night, kind of in incognito, comes in, probably wearing you know, the face with the glasses and the nose and the mustache and everything, so no one of the, the rest of the Sanhedrin would know who he is, comes to Jesus, and, and he asks him, he said, what must I do to be saved? And then Jesus gives him the gospel. Well, it's for God so love the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. But after that, Nicodemus goes AWOL for three years. We don't have any more knowledge of Nicodemus until we get here to after Jesus has died. We know even less of Joseph of Arimathea We know that he was a rich man, as the other synoptic gospels tell us. He was a member of the Sanhedrin, the ruling body of of the the Israelites. So he would have lived in Jerusalem. So he would have been very knowledgeable of the Hebrew scriptures. He would have uh, been likely a a, a legal scholar. He would have been powerful. For he had an unused tomb, a garden tomb, right outside the city of Jerusalem. But we see that both of these men who lived in secret, why? Out of fear. Fear for themselves and justifiably so. But when it came to the death of Jesus, no longer were they plagued by that fear. And they go to Pilate and Joseph says, I I I want his body. I want to give him my tomb so that he can be buried in the tomb that is fit for a king. Do you understand the risk that both Joseph and Nicodemus took? At best, they lost their status. I'm quite sure if they had an impeachment process, which I doubt they did back in the day, they would have been kicked out of the Sanhedrin, persecuted in... maybe even lost their lives. But they knew all of this because they had seen the ruthlessness of the so-called law followers, their dedication in seeing Jesus killed, but they, they saw Jesus on that cross. They said this, is who I must follow. It's the blood of Jesus that washes away our sins and it frees us to live for Him. No matter the world tells you, well, you can live for Jesus as long as you just keep it to yourself. 
as long as it, you know, you don't put it on other people. You can live for Jesus, you know what? But hey, it's going to cost you. But guess what? The Bible tells us it will cost us. But it costs us nothing in comparison to what Christ went through, but even more so of what we gain. For we gain abundant life here on earth and eternal life in heaven forever. I'm going to close with the words of the Apostle Paul to give us confidence that we have in the blood of Jesus. 1 Corinthians 15. Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and which you stand and by which you are being saved. If you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I deliver to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ had died for our sins in accordance with what? The, the scriptures. That he was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. And that he appeared to Cephas, Paul, or Peter, and then to the 12. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. And last of all, as to one untimely born, he also, or he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. Oh, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain. Oh, on the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preached and you also believed. Nicodemus, Joseph of Arimathea, denied Christ. Then they believed in him. At least with Nicodemus, he believed in him. But he didn't follow him for three years. The Apostle Paul was a persecutor of Christians. He was the superhero of the persecuting Pharisees, authorizing Stephen's death. But yet he had an encounter with Jesus on that, on that Damascus road. You know what, at the beginning, all of these men and every other person in Scripture, and you and I, were enemies of God. But no matter where you are, no matter what you've done in the past, the past is the past. For it's more, far more important how we finish than how we, how we begin. Because until you experience the power of God through the blood of Jesus Christ, we're dead in our sin. But it is the gift of God through Christ Jesus our Lord that we are saved and have everlasting life. So it is the blood of Jesus that washes away our sins and frees us to live for him. Would you pray with me, please?